Spirit, we honor you. We say, Lord, that apart from you, we can do nothing. But we rejoice in the fact that it is your delight to place your presence upon weak human flesh and to partner with us and to uh, empower us to speak your word and to receive your word and to uh, grow further into the image of Jesus. That's our desire, Lord. We love your presence and we love your work in our hearts. Strengthen us through this time. I pray, Father, that you would give endurance and strength to our physical bodies, Lord, after a uh, an overwhelming week of input, God, would you just strengthen us to receive even more and to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches in these days. Thank you, Lord. We love you and we bless you. Amen. Amen. Welcome the e-school students that are watching online or on the video. Bless you. May the Lord increase your understanding as we go through these notes this afternoon. We're on session 15. The Bride's Vindication and Empowering. How are you guys doing? This has been a grueling week. Bless your hearts. I can only imagine. <laughs> wow. I'm dumping 15 years of understanding into your little minds in one week here. and May the Lord give you grace to increase. All right. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 11. I love this opening phrase of this section of Scripture because sometimes you wonder whether the Lord has a sense of humor in how he talks about the body of Christ. He says, she says, I went down to the Garden of Nuts. Um... <laughs> to see the verdure of the valley. I don't know, I always felt like he was talking about me and my friends, you know. Um, sorry, that's probably not too reverent, but it just always strikes me as, a, as an apropos way of talking about God's people in their silliness and immaturity. All right, let's try this again. Chapter 6, verse 11, I went down to the garden of nuts to see the verdure of the valley, to see whether the vine had budded and the pomegranates had bloomed. And before I was even aware, my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return that we may look upon you. So what would you see in the Shulamite, as it were a dance of the two camps? But how beautiful your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. The curves of your thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a skillful workman. Your navel is a rounded goblet, it, it lacks no blended beverage. Your waist is a heap of wheat set about with lilies. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Your neck is like an ivory tower, your eyes like the pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Ravim. Your nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looks toward Damascus. Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel, and the hair of your head is like purple. A king is held captive by your tresses. How fair and pleasant you are, O love, with your delights. This stature of yours is like a palm tree, and your breasts like its clusters. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. I will take hold of its branches. Now let your breasts be like clusters of the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and the roof of your mouth like the best wine. And the wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving, moving gently the lips of sleepers. So in that section, there are a number of different speakers, and it's like a, the Holy Spirit is giving a, a prophetic projection into the future of the Shulamite's ministry. And in some ways, this final, uh, these final segments of the Song of Solomon are uh, a little more difficult to, to enter into because they're, they're more projected into the ministry that we're going to have as we come into some measure of maturity. Most of us find ourselves in the middle of the journey somewhere where we're you know, encountering difficulties, encountering resistance, 
coming face to face with our own immaturity. And so these last sections of the book really speak about the bride in her maturity. And again, the, the whole reality of the book is that it's a, a series of cyclical experiences. And we touch one area and then find ourselves for a season in another area and go back and forth. And we will we'll find ourselves touching mature places of ministry every once in a while. And then the next moment you feel like you're back in freshman class again. How many of you know it's, it's kind of like going to school, you know? You, you, you start out in first grade, and then you get, bless God, I finally finished grade school, but then you've got to go to middle school, and you're the new guy on the block again. And then a couple of years later, you're the you know, ninth grader, and you're the new guy, new guy on the block. And then you're a freshman in college, and then you're the first-year grad student. So now you've come through a, ma- a, a massive part of your journey already, and now you're first-year students again. Who can figure? And so the Song of Solomon is like that. We come to different stages and we come to different levels of maturity. And so the good thing in these uh, sections is to get a prophetic picture, get a sense of destiny that where the Holy Spirit wants to take us in the, in the maturity of our ministry because it is that sense of destiny that gives us the courage to cast off uh, distractions. The Word of God says that when... Uh, when people lose a sense of prophetic destiny, they cast off restraint. And the result of that is a disillusion of their focus and a, uh, a, a, a disillusion of their uh, intensity and of their capacity to, to follow God with a, with a good purpose. And so we want to have a prophetic vision of where we're going. It's in the embrace of that prophetic vision that we find the strength then to uh, embrace the, the journey as it leads us there. The end is worth the journey. So we want to talk, first of all, about the bride's passion for the body of Christ. As she gives herself to him, something awakens in her heart. And we begin to love the church, not because the church is so lovely, but because he loves the church. And I believe that this is a a key thing for us in understanding the ministry of Jesus. And if we understand it in the ministry of Jesus, then we can uh, gain some understanding in terms of our own involvement in, in ministry life. Jesus, and I've said this several times, but it's so important for us to get this um, as, a, as a fundamental precept in our understanding because we're so oriented in our culture, we're so oriented to ministry activity. Um, the, the church basically is a, a, an activity addicted or, organization. We are not primarily in the, in the larger body of Christ. We are not primarily Jesus addicted. We're primarily ministry addicted. And so there needs to be a a group of people who will break that pattern, become Jesus addicted, and then let him move our hearts for what he feels about the bride so that even in ministry we're only still responding to him. The goal is not to come deep in Christ and then leave him to go do ministry. The goal in this whole thing, and we'll see it in the Shulamites' experience, the goal is to engage ministry with him. That he leads us in this place, just like he did in his relationship with the Father. I do nothing except what I see my Father doing. I only speak what I hear my Father speaking. And the good news is, the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he does. And and so we can trust that that um, that same paradigm is available to us. That because of the Father's love, he yearns to show us what he's doing. Jesus said it later in John 15 to the disciples. He said, obey my commandments. My commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. And if you walk in this kind of commandment, uh, you will ask what you will, and I will do it for you. And then uh, he goes on and he says, you know, I used to call you servants. I don't want to call you servants anymore. I I don't want to have a master-servant relationship with you. How many of you know what it is to work for God? Um, working for God is exhausting. He, he doesn't have any intention. That was, the, that was the dilemma of the older brother in Luke chapter 15. His estrangement from his father came because he had a slave mentality in the, in the family, in the household. He didn't work out of partnership with the father. He worked as a slave for the father. Jesus' model was to work in partnership with the father. 
And, and so because he worked for the father, he developed a slave mentality and became embittered against the, the things that were passionate in the father's heart. Does that make sense? Jesus never did that. He, he teaches us something else. So he says to his, his disciples, I don't want to call you servants. I don't want to have that kind of relationship with you. I want to call you friends. I want to do this ministry thing out of intimate communion where you uh, abide in me and my word abides in you and we live in that place of communion and effective and powerful prayer. And he says, because I've called you friends... I have made known to you everything the Father has spoken to me. See, there's our resource for effectiveness in, in ministry down the road as we, as we cultivate this thing. That's the end, pro, uh, end product of this journey is that Jesus says, This Father who loves me and shows me everything he does has given me permission to let you in on the deal. And as we uh, emerge in this relationship of friendship, I will show you everything the Father shows me, and you will see greater works than these that will emerge out of your ministry. That's a good promise. But it's all rooted in, in intimate friendship and in cooperation with the Spirit of Christ in the work of ministry. So we, we see this as uh, the end product, this kind of joint ministry together with Jesus in a, in a joyful communion with him as the, the goal of our journey, and that gives us the courage to embrace the process of the journey that will produce that thing. So she says, I went down to the Garden of Nuts. It's talking about a walnut grove, the kind of thing that's particularly mentioned in that, uh, in that phrase is a, is a grove of walnut trees. And the, uh, the, the trees are, uh, there's some dynamics about walnut trees that are very interesting. They give great shade. They're a place of re refreshment and protection. The, uh, the oil of a walnut tree is used to make soap, so it's a place of cleansing. And all of, those, all of these things are prophetic images of the, the, the life of Christ in the church. Fragrant leaves are used to make healing anointment. You remember in the book of Revelation, it says that there are trees that are on either side of the river that flows from the throne of God, and the leaves are for healing in its season. And a, and a, a, a walnut tree is a representation of that. The breaking and the crushing of its fruit, uh, life-giving elements in the fruit of the walnut. So there's a, there are good reasons why the Lord uses that as a picture for the body of Christ. She goes down to see the, the, the fruitfulness of the body of Christ, to see whether the vine had budded. Here it's uh, the church in immaturity. It's a budding vine. There's fruit that's beginning to emerge. Um, the scripture calls the people of God, God's vineyard in Isaiah and Matthew and in the gospel of John. So there's, there's emerging fruitfulness, but it's yet immature. And so here comes the bride in her place of strength and her maturity and in cooperation with the Lord to come and strengthen that immature fruit that's there. And that becomes the, the delight of our hearts to see, you know, to have the opportunity to come and invest and uh, uh, speak into the lives of young believers and see them strengthened and see them established and rooted in foundations and um, see how the Lord builds a history of, of life and ministry. We're just in, in the uh, other room talking to some of the third and fourth, fourth year students with Murray and Deborah Hebert. And uh, Murray was introducing us, and, and he was kind of telling the story of um, the role that I played in getting Murray to come down here in the first place and how he and Deborah met, and I actually married them in a marvelous wedding ceremony over at Evangel Temple. And it was just fun to, to reflect on that 10, 12-year-old history. I went up and did a conference in Minneapolis where Murray was part of a pastoral team, and he got excited about the house of prayer, had never heard about it, and didn't really know what was going on. Came down to visit at a One Thing conference, got hooked on the harp and bowl model. I trained him in the harp and bowl, and he, and he came down, met Deborah, fell in love, you know. And, and, and so here is a, a, a history of investment in a budding vine that I get to come now 10, 12 years later and take a look at that and say, wow, look at them. Look at them go. And it's so delightful and it's so invigorating to see that downline of investment. How many of you know God's got the best uh, multi-level marketing deal in the universe? I mean, you invest in a few and it multiplies and it all goes to your spiritual downline. I like that 
concept. I'm hanging on to it. You can have it your own way, but I'm taking it. And, and so I, I love that kind of picture. And so we get to go and invest in the, in the bride and, and take that journey and see how the things, I mean, I look back at the journey of my own life and there's been, there have been those ups and downs and there have been those times when I didn't know whether I could find God in something. And, and, and then you, you just, you know, I remember one season in my life 20 years ago or so, phew, 20 years ago, and it was a dark season, and, and the Lord was dealing with some stuff and, and some uh, ineffective things and bad things in my own leadership style. And I had a relationship with Bob Jones in those days, a prophetic guy that was in Kansas City at the time. And, and so uh, I called Bob Jones one, sa- one day, and I said, uh, Bob, does the Lord have a, a word for me? I need a word from God, man. I'm in, I'm in trouble. I need a word from God. And he said, yep, yep. Papa told me this morning you'd be calling. I said, good. I need a word from God. He said, did he, I said, did he speak to you about me? He said, yep. I said, what did he say? He said, don't die. I said, what? He said, don't die. I said, thank you very much. You know, that, that's it? Don't die? He said, yep. And, 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 you know, at the, at the time, it seemed like, you know, throwing a dying man a, 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 an empty bone, you know, a, a bone with no meat on it. But it was, it was the true word of the Lord. It was about hanging on, trusting the Lord, humbling myself before him, uh, accepting the medicine that he was feeding me in that day, and not quitting. You know, sometimes there, just, there, there, there comes a history in God by just not quitting, just by keeping showing up the next day and and whether it's because you don't know what else to do it doesn't matter you know you just keep going and all of a sudden 20 years later I've got a history in God and and I can come and and my doorway or my valley of trouble becomes a doorway of hope for some other people and I have a little depth and I have a little bit of of something to offer well that's all coming for you guys and, and to a certain degree, it's already there. You can already begin. That's what he meant clear back at the beginning of the book where he said, as you're learning these things, feed that little flock of goats that's following you around. Testify of these things. Take this information that you're learning and begin to feed your sphere of influence, however large it is. Speak to your friends. Put it on your blog. Put it on your Facebook page. Let whoever... Uh, touches you at whatever level, let them drink from this fountain and the Lord will deepen this thing and, and take you on the journey of being able to minister to the young body of Christ, to the immature body of Christ. You commit yourself to that and you say, you know what, I am destined for a life of fruitfulness and, and it's not all going to come in the next 15 minutes. There's, there's going to be a 20-year a, a journey, a 30-year journey into God that will bear its fruit in due season if we do not grow weary. The pomegranates had bloomed. The church is compared to a, a blossoming pomegranate, the first stages of individual believers coming to maturity, developing the sweetness of the character of Jesus. You know, when, when you see a pomegranate tree that's blooming, it hasn't borne its fruit yet. The tree's there, the blossoms are there, it's the promise of something. But that promise is a good thing. You know, I get to still travel a little bit, and, and uh, one of the things I discovered in, in some of my travels going to Korea over the last three or four years, I've been to Korea a number of times and ministered to the church there, and I fell in love with Asian pears. Any of you guys know what Asian pears are? I love those, I love that fruit. So we... we uh, uh, we were out, my wife's a gardener, and like I said, she's a wonderful gardener and an artist in the, in the whole arena of gardening. I'm the pack mule, and she designs things, and I go buy the dirt and do that thing. And um, we found an Asian pear tree. And so oh, I was all excited, and we planted the Asian pear tree, and we watched that thing, and we nurtured it, and we got mad when the deer came and ate the blossoms off the thing. We, you know, we, we just watched that thing, and we watched it. No fruit. Nothing to it. We watched it for two years. No fruit. Finally, we went to a gardener. We said, what's going on? We got an Asian pear tree. No fruit. He said, you need two Asian pear trees. They have to fertilize. They can't pollinate if you only have one. Oh, that shows how much we know, you know. We're great. 
So last year we went out and bought another Asian pear tree. This year we uh, had blossoms on the Asian pear tree and, and we were so excited because the blossoms were there. No fruit yet, but blossoms. And we watched those blossoms and we nourished it and we sang over it as we watered it and when I mowed the lawn and singing over the Asian pear trees, right? <laughs> Prophesying to the fruit trees. Be blessed, be fruitful and multiply, you know? And we got three Asian pears this year. Little tiny things. The biggest one was about like that, you know, the, and, and in their maturity they'll be big and, and luscious, but they were sweet and they were good and it's the promise of wonders to come. See, that, that's what ministry can be like. That's what the Lord intends for ministry to be like, that we go and we see the blossoms that are forming and we say, you know what, there's fruit coming. Pollination has happened. There's good stuff that's on the way. The Lord has infused something there and we get to go be part of that and speak into it. Letter B, page two, her soul is moved to intercession by the whole church. She says, my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. It's a beautiful poetic phrase. What in the world does it mean? Well, the chariot was the most efficient and easily moved vehicle of the day. It was the, uh, the, the, the BMW of the time because it was the, the high-end military vehicle. The king's chariots had to be uh, the, the easiest and most maneuverable vehicles of the day, designed for speed and safety in battle, powered by mighty horses, durable and, and potent as a weapon. And so she said, my soul is like that. What does it mean? It, 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 the interpretation that we've come to is this. Before she was even aware of it, the Shulamite says, my soul, I began to wage the war of intercession over the people of God. My soul became a vehicle of warfare, an intercessory missionary, a, a person whose soul is easily moved by the condition of the people of God. It's not difficult for me now to enter into a spirit of intercession, but, but the, the people have become noble in my sight, and, and it's easy thing now for my soul to be moved to pray and, and to intercede for the, the blessing of the people of God, blessing of the church. Brides then affirmed by the body of Christ. The, the speaker shifts now. In verse 13, if you have a, a, new, um, or rather a new King James Version, it says the beloved and his friends. I think it's the friends that are speaking, or the daughters of Jerusalem. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return that we may look at you, look upon you. And this, this is a, a, a desire. The church has now, or the, the friends of the bridegroom have fallen in love with the Shulamite. They love to see what's happening there, and they're, they're pleading with her to stay with them. And she's, uh, there, there's a withdrawing from them because she's engaging now in ministry that the, that the king has called her to. In the involvement uh, among the people of God, the king has called her to. They've observed her journey, and, and they, they want to gaze upon her. They're enjoying her influence. They speak the word return four times. They, they want to have her influence and her presence, the, the fragrance of her beauty in their midst. It's a beautiful and dangerous place for the bride. Because the, the Lord is so interesting, so confident, that he is willing to invest great beauty in you at the risk of um, his beauty becoming your focus. I mean, his beauty in you becoming your focus. Where there would be an, uh, an emergent, the risk of pride and the risk of, uh, of arrogance, the risk of, of self, self-confidence. You know, there's a kind of self-confidence that's okay, but there's a, there's a, a self-centered self-confidence that really doesn't have a place in the, in the believing heart. We want to be confident in the Lord's presence. And that's not, that's not self-deprecating. It's putting self in the proper perspective. We are vehicles of his presence, and, and we want him to have that place and, and to shine in that place. And so what the Lord does to balance that thing out, that temptation to uh, give in to that sense of, wow, I'm, you know, I've, I've really arrived now. It's, it's really good. The people love to see me come. They love to, to have me in their presence and to drink from the fruit of my life. Oh, I feel so good. And then these other voices come. And again, the New King James uh, translators think it's the Shulamite speaking, but I like the understanding that it's 
the voices of those spiritual leaders, the dissidents, the dissenters, the ones that have been discouraging to her. And they basically say to the body of Christ, what do you see in her? What is it about that thing that you like? What would you see in the Shulamite? Is it the dance of two camps? And that, that word, the dance of two camps there, it's a significant word. The Hebrew word there is Mahanaim. And it refers to the place where Esau and Jacob battled it out. So that word has the connotation of battle, of spiritual conflict. And there's a, there's a jealousy and there's a resentment that is at the root of that word Mahanaim. And, and, and it's kind of a mysterious phrase, but it's, uh, I believe it's being made by the watchmen who resist her. They don't comprehend her. They don't agree with the choices of obedience to Jesus. They're critical. And they're saying to the rest of the church, what do you see in that? You know, one of the things that, that's, that's going to be interesting in, in days to come is the increasing exposure of the prayer movement and the increasing tension centered around the prayer movement. The Lord's beginning to exhibit it in some interesting ways. There are some things that are uh, coming in the near future that, um, where, where the, the house of prayer and the, and the prayer ministries around the earth are going to be exposed in more of a national kind of way. And the reaction's going to be mixed to that. That's not always a good thing. Uh, publicity is not always a good thing. And, and that's why it's important that you never want to seek your own publicity. Let the Lord bring it when he brings it, but fasten your seatbelts because it always brings a mixed response. There are always those that are happy for you, and there are always those that are not so glad. And uh, the Lord does that on purpose. He gives us the gift of resistant people in order to keep our, uh, our, our pride in check. He says, I'm going to give you just enough resistance, not to defeat you, but to keep you in a place of dependence and uh, uh, resting in, in my grace and in my strength for you. This conflict is seen a number of times in Scripture. Joseph and his brothers. The, the conflict, and, and, and this is where you see we come back to that cyclical thing. Because here the, the Shulamite has come through this journey, through this dark night. She's in a place now where there's, where there's delight and joy and ministry. And right in the middle of her success come these negative voices again. What do you see in her? What, what, what makes you excited about that ministry? And she has, to, she has to deal with that resistance that's coming against her, even though she's in a place of, of, of strength and of fruitfulness now. Does that make sense? And... Lo and behold, she cycles right back into that uh, thing of, of having to figure out how to deal with resistant hearts that call themselves lovers of God. Joseph and his brothers is the example. We talked about that, that, that Joseph had a vision from God, and it was necessary for his brothers to resist him in order for him to take his place. That's what we have to get. It, it's, it, it's a difficult concept for us to grasp, but the... The resistance of Joseph's brothers was a blessing to him. The resistance of Joseph's brothers was a blessing because it drove him into the place of his destiny. Same thing with Saul and David. To be the king that David became to be, he needed to be mentored by a demonized man. It's how God sets it up. God chose Saul to mentor David, to drive David into the heart of God. It was the only way he could make it. And, and, and it's, it's that kind of resistance that, that brings us to the place where all of our internal stuff comes to the surface. How many of you know it's under pressure that you find out who you really are? Right? See, a lot of times we'll say something like this. You know, I'm under pressure. I'm not myself today. I'm feeling so much pressure. I'm just not really myself. Oh, yes, you are. It's when there's no pressure that you're not yourself. It's when, you're no, it's when there's no pressure that the facades can stay in place. Hello? It's when the pressure...